as we all know, YouTube has evolved into a melting pot of video clip assets, ranging from laugh out loud clips of animals and humans in precarious situations, how to's on everything from video game walkthroughs to 12 ways to put on lipstick through to obscure things like how to rebuild a snowblower motor. And some of the more standard type of stuff like branded content and rebroadcasts of, of theatrical releases. Now, I'd like to pose a question to the panel. What, from a broad perspective, what do you consider to be the best practices and key drivers of maximizing influencer and other content in the YouTube channel? Can we start with Mary from YouTube? So um, one of the key principles we start with, uh, I'm sure we'll get to paid, earned, and owned, and ratios and stuff like that, but we try to start our brands and make something great and really make something that users want to watch. Because if you do that, a lot of the other stuff falls uh, pretty naturally. So one of the things that we talk about a lot is you have to provide some form of utility. And that doesn't just mean making someone laugh. It could be um, entertainment is a utility. But so is inspirational content. So you see P&G with their mom's campaigns really tugging on heartstrings. That's a utility for someone who's down or just wants to feel some goosebumps in the day. And then how to. Um, so I think brands have a huge amount of work to do and can really play in that space pretty easily. Where if you look at Home Depot's channel, really, really robust brand presence, uh, they've mastered this, right? So how to tile a bathroom floor has almost 2 million views and a really high retention curve because people are always going to be searching for how to tile a bathroom floor. So really honing in if you're a brand on what the questions you can answer are and where you have an authority. Um, finance is another one. You look at Charles Schwab's channels or a lot of the banking uh, work that uh, BAA is doing with Salcon where they're actually trying to empower consumers through answering questions on, on education. I mean, that's in a massive form of utility, so really kind of safe and natural place for brands to get started. Can you ask the question again? Oh, sure. What, what do you consider to be some of the best practices in getting content to discovered and to trend within the YouTube environment? Sure. Okay. Um, we have a unique proposition in that we are the company finding the content, um, and we have a proprietary methodology, technology, and uh, people in four countries doing this. Um, we've only in the past year started collaborating with brands uh, very carefully um, because this is homegrown, this is people falling down, this is cats, um, this is Tori burning her hair with a curling iron. You know, it's very, um, very enticing to brands because they can get a 100% share of voice, but it's also they have to proceed very cautiously and we are very sensitive to that and work closely with them. So I think our discovery process is slowly um, modifying a bit so we can become more enticing to brands, the offer we can, we can bring to them. Um, yeah. I think one of the biggest, biggest things that we do um, is that we make it about the audience, and not necessarily about our brand. Uh, we've had a lot of success with uh, influencers talking about our brands organically. Um, any Rooster Teeth fans, Bernie Burns did a video um, they animated like one of their, their vlogs and he tells a story about a time he got really, really drunk, walked into a restaurant and screamed at everyone, I'm Catbug, um, which is a line from one of our cartoons. Uh, Rosanna Pansino, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing it right, um, did how to make peanut butter squares from one of our episodes because one of our characters um, made peanut butter squares or brought, this is getting crazy, but brought peanut butter squares back from the see-through zone with his alternate dimension, blah, 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 blah. blah. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, for us, it, it's, it's a matter of creating great stories with very lovable characters and allowing the audience and the community to develop it naturally. So Tubular has five secrets to YouTube success. So I'll also tell two of them right now since I think they're most applicable. Um, the first one is, and this may be obvious since we're at an influencer conference, um, but it's to partner with native YouTube influencers. There's so many brands out there who will hire Beyonce or hire Tina Fey to do their YouTube content, and it's just not worth it at all. So the average YouTube channel gets about 2.5% engagement. The average brand channel gets 0.3% engagement. Um, someone like Bethany Moda gets 10% engagement. So if you partner with, uh, with someone who's taken years to build their YouTube audience, uh, that's just absolutely the right answer for brands who are looking to grow their own audience in the YouTube space. Um, the, second, uh, the second tip is around um, knowing who's in your audience. 
if you're a brand, there are many influencers out there who are already creating content about you, and you might not even know it. So you could look and say, so th for example, through Tubular, you could search and say, Maybelline, who's making content about Maybelline? And then reach out to those influencers that are doing that. Um, and you can curate that content, you can use that content and promote it, um, but it's just, there's so much, 80% of Samsung content on YouTube is created by fans, not by Samsung. So just having a 360 view of your brand and what's out there is um, gonna help you a lot as you look to grow an audience. Um, so there's, uh, there's really two things you can do uh, if you're a brand to really get your video more discoverable. So one, which is pretty obvious, you gotta create awesome content, right? You gotta create content that's relevant, content that's today, content that's built to your KPI. So you really have to ask yourself, you're not really creating viral videos, you're really creating content that basically really jives to what you're trying to capture. Like are you trying to generate leads, or are you trying to generate earned media, et cetera, right? And the second component, which is something that everyone here does if you're a brand, is buy targeted and contextual media to really get your uh, content out there. People overlook this a lot of times, and what people are finding is that it's absolutely necessary. If you have a great creative, you need to get it out there, right? And the most important part of it is getting out there to the right people in the right places. So contextually targeting, for example, um, a gaming trailer or a gaming piece of content against other gaming uh, type of influencer content is really, really important. Does anybody remember the Jennifer Aniston smart water ad that was on YouTube? I feel like that was like the only time I've seen a celebrity like properly utilized in YouTube video marketing. Mount Secretary. I remember it. <laughs> Show of hands. Yeah, no, that, that campaign also did really well. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Tony, what, what you just said is a great segue to the next question. This regards trending, which is something that your company is known for. Now, the YouTube ecosystem has changed quite a bit in the last few years where trending a few years ago may not be the same as trending today, and the importance of trending and, and setting up your, your campaign for trending may not be as relevant. So could you touch on that and some of the best practices for discovery through trending? Sure, um, so, and, and, and feel free to uh, add in any components here about YouTube. Um, but basically, you know, YouTube has transformed itself over the last couple of years. And, you know, three years ago, um, to get a video discoverable, you basically had to try to generate as many views as possible and try to get as many people to share it. And you'll get discovered through how YouTube curates content, right? And as YouTube has uh, evolved and grown over time, and there's just a lot more data and a lot more content creators that are more premium, you know, now it's all about relevancy. Right now it's all about contextualism. And, um, and that's kind of, you know, today if your goal is to really generate earned media, to really, uh, you know, uh, instigate some sort of violence to a video, you have to really contextually target. So like, for example, if you're advertising against like on a CNN night show, you can't, you know, it, the, the content has to be, you know, it's not like Dora the Explorer ad, right? It has to be something really, really relevant. And that's how, you know, trending is really, really relevant today. Now what about some of the old tactics like um, v view velocity and time of post and shared links and all those other things? Are they still relevant in this day and age? You know, well, we know YouTube. If you're using YouTube as as you know as your central tool, your your sort of main marketing tool, we know that they're measuring. And Mary, you can speak to this: watch time and shareability. It's the it's the P. So um, they actually is a, they won't tell you specifics, but there's an actual name and there's a metric that they're expecting your channel to or your well your channel to succeed at in order to then push that content. Um, more consistently, more regularly, and, and more and more wide. Yeah, I don't have the algorithm in my pocket. I, I was going to ask you that. Yeah. Yeah. No, we I, all want the algorithm. I think I think you guys summed it up right. It it really is about trying to track what users are caring about and engaging with. So I think some folks have touched on this earlier today that views should not all be considered equal. Um, and when clients come to me and say they I want a viral hit or I want five million views. I'm like, great, why? And the, the look kind of goes blank because it, it's a good cheerleading and makes a CMO feel good to see a huge view count, but it really masks a lot of the story. And I think that that's why a lot of the product team made these decisions to say, let's look at completion rate, let's look at how fast a video is traveling, how many shares it's getting, how many comments it's getting, 
versus you know something with 50 million views, a lot of which might be bought or seeded or uh, two second completes because someone kind of got tricked into watching it. It really masks a lot. So I, I do think it's, it's accurate to say there's really been a 180 switch of the ingredients. Um, but I'd go back to, to what else we're saying, which is if you start with making great content, it, you worry less about the other stuff. And some of that is around just understanding um, discoverability to us really means understanding what users are talking about. You know, if the World Cup's going on, there's going to be a lot of searches around the World Cup. What do you as a brand or marketer have to play off that zeitgeist? And can you be a part of that conversation? It's a little less, I want a viral video about the World Cup. It's, it's more just recognizing what people are talking about and building a content strategy around it. Just, a, a, I don't know if this is a warning to brand marketers, but YouTube um, rewards watch time. The longer you're there, the longer you keep somebody on your channel or around your content or in the YouTube ecosphere as a whole, the, 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 more, the higher up you are in their ranking system. This is a conundrum for brands because a conversion is get off YouTube and buy my product. So they offer this, I've always wondered, I don't know if you can answer this, but they offer these really amazing tools where they authorize external websites and they authorize merch. And does, I've always wondered, does that, do you know if that affects watch time at all? If, if I'm moving, if I'm, if I'm a brand and I'm moving my consumer off YouTube but to an authorized site? Yeah, so we enable external, they're called external annotations uh, for marketers. Um, and also actually first, there's, you know, logistics related to if you're a marketer that collaborates with a channel and the video gets posted, um, you know, we can try to figure that out too to see if the creator could have external annotations on that video too. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know the answer to be honest. Um, if, if I imagine it's not a sizable impact. Um, I mean, I, I do think a lot of what we try to talk to the brands that I work most closely with is, do you care about subscribers? And they usually don't, and then I wonder why, right? You, you've spent probably three or four years building up Facebook likes. There's a sense of, well, I want to keep people in my Facebook ecosystem because they want to be there. It doesn't really feel like YouTube's gotten the fair uh, side of that story so far because I, I do think there's a lot of value to saying, well, someone spent 30 hours with your brand in the last month. That's probably a good sign, and eventually they're going to get off site. Um, but I, I try to kind of tell clients to tone down the rhetoric a little bit, they will leave when they want to, and you can't force a consumer down the path as much as they might want to. You know, following on watch time, what's really interesting is that, you know, discoverability and featuring, a lot of it is based on watch time, engagement, relevancy. Uh, what we're also seeing from a media perspective is, um, and especially like TrueView, is uh, the more uh, someone watches the content, the more engaging it is, the actually cheaper it is to promote it. Yeah. You know, that's it's, it's pretty logical, but at the same time, it's, it's your to your point about a conundrum. Like if your goal is watch time, you can't really take someone off uh, off that ad, basically. And I actually think it's a waste of time to think about gaming the system in terms of watch time. Or you know, back in the day, you would try and get as many views as quickly as possible to get on the YouTube homepage, and that was a key. Today, I don't think it's worth it to use data to game the system. What you really should use data for is, for example. Um, if you're HGTV, and this is some work we did, and they wanted to find a way to reach millennials with their, with their traditional content, we did an analysis to say, okay, DIY is the most popular uh, home and garden topic on YouTube. Or for example, with gaming, Minecraft is very po popular. Um, and sort of using the data to decide what are the topics that are popular, what is the content that the YouTube audience is consuming, and then create content in that vertical. And if you're trying to promote it, then promote content across all DIY content and partner with DIY influencers and use the data to really understand the audiences and what their preferences are instead of using the data to say, you know, if I tweak this lever a little bit and this one, then this terrible video will go viral. It doesn't work like that. It's about creating good content and knowing what kind of content to create. And, and just to add, and, and forgive me if you, if you know this, but the discoverability on YouTube is not the same as, as the discoverability on Google search. And so knowing that going in will determine how you strategize how your piece of content or your channel is going to get discovered. That's a great point. Now, it's also a good segue to the next topic, which deals with how much is enough. Now, a lot of homegrown influencers started with zero funds, a little bit of web savvy, and in some cases, blind luck to build views on their channel. But we all know that the, mar that the ecosystem is changing and we need to do more than that. We can't just launch and forget and build it and hope they will come. 
It's more about a tactical approach, which in some cases involves paid media and amplification. Now, based on all of your collective experience, how much do you think is necessary and what kind of tactics on the paid side need to be employed to drive successful usage of video content? I think it completely depends on what the goals are. <clears throat> I mean, if, if a brand has a campaign like a movie, right, and everything's leading up to the movie release, well then you wanna push it out right away. However, if a brand has a, you know, always on content approach, right, where they're gonna be continually making content, well then I think it's more about efficiently using that spend in true view and uh, generating those subscribers and those follow on views and, and optimizing around the, uh, the videos and the ads that are performing best within those campaigns. Anyone else have anything to add to that? Yeah, I would just say one of the benefits of TrueView and you know Channel Factory and other networks out there is that they're very flexible from, and I, we heard this from some of the other panelists, that you can go in a much shorter campaign window than you used to, right? I, I would see media plans from an agency that would say, flight this evenly over three months, mm -hmm. spend the same budget every day, and it's like, why are we still doing that? There's no reason to plan so far in advance, other than organizations still really depend on that, and that's how reporting lines work. So in reality, it should be have a channel strategy, have your goal, and you know assume that 20% of your plan is, is right, and the other 80% is gonna be up for debate, because you don't necessarily know what's gonna get shared or go viral, and you wanna save some funds to say, well, this is actually a great piece of content, it's testing well when people see it, I just need to get more eyeballs on it, and you can throw a little bit more gas onto it, wait a couple days, a week. If it starts taking off organically, you're good. Um, but if you need to throw a little bit more on, you can. And again, I think all too often marketers just try to plan a really even flight, and it doesn't work like that. So what you're hitting on is this whole notion of agile marketing and reacting to the campaign in real time, and most likely ties into some of the analytics that, we, that YouTube provides for marketers. Yeah, I mean, definitely, I think, um, and Tubular and, and you know third parties and then just YouTube analytics in general is a wealth of, of almost real-time data. Um, and then for you know paying campaigns, we just launched something called Brandlift, uh, which is for TrueView campaigns that hit a certain impression level. So you know it's not for a five dollar a day campaign, but it's not exorbitantly expensive. Uh, we'll give you a free report that shows is this shifting awareness or is this shifting purchase intent, and also is this actually stimulating search because people can uh, to the problem of this isn't driving sales or they're not leaving YouTube. If I feel most marketers are convinced that if someone watches a video and then goes and searches for the brand name or product, that's a pretty clear signal of intent. So we're working on stuff like that, that again will be within a couple days of launching a campaign, not a couple weeks or two months afterwards like some of the third parties used to be. You know, from a distribution standpoint of view, what you really want to have is a clear idea of where you're gonna run your media in addition to agile testing. So a lot of times people kind of like pay, put a budget together, kind of spray it and pray it works and kind of optimize. But if you're, you know, depending on your brand goals, you know, CTR, if it's your, you know, uh, completion rate or earned media, you know, understanding exactly what channels you're advertising against, what videos specifically can really help enhance brand safety, transparency, just how you buy traditional billboard media. I think so on YouTube is very, very important. Also, one thing you can't forget about is that, you know, YouTube is a big ecosystem for video, but on the off YouTube side for just in general native, there's another aspect of reaching audiences that are that are on and off YouTube at the same time and kind of having a holistic approach is is very important, but contextually targeting on it for a true view and from uh, you know, targeting the right channels will be really important to help you essentially generate, you know, the success. Great. And the key thing to remember is that promotion is a, is a key piece of distribution. So you should, broadly speaking, brands should be spending less on production and more on promotion um, than they are today. So on YouTube, what works, and it's a buzzword for the day, but is authenticity. And so a girl who's doing her hair in her bedroom and um, is gonna get three million views and, and paying someone, um, a celebrity stylist to do someone's hair at New York Fashion Week is gonna get 3,000 views. And so how can you think about not paying that celebrity stylist, but instead working with an influencer and then uh, relying on their organic audience, but also um, putting some paid promotion behind it to just get it to an audience who would watch it if they knew that, that it existed, but may not know that the content's out there. So is the front page of YouTube no longer as relevant as it used to be for discoverability and just reaching a mass audience? 
Because someone had mentioned earlier that it well, wasn't What as is the front page of YouTube these days? Yeah. <coughs> is the front page of YouTube the feed when you go there? Is it youtube.com slash browse? Is it one of the various channels? Like the, the YouTube homepage feed in, in a lot of ways has, you know, basically become useless as a uh, viral discovery tool to use kind of very general terms to describe it. Um, it certainly helps still, right? You get on to the, whatever the front page of YouTube is these days, you're still gonna get a million, two million-ish views, but you're not an overnight celebrity. You're not doing 20 million views overnight. But that one to two million views can be the catalyst for millions and millions of more views if you have the right content. Right. There, there also, the, the increase in mobile has, ch again, changed what the YouTube experience is. Um, there isn't a homepage per se anymore on mobile. Fail Army has something like 53% mobile use. Um, changes ex enormously how we develop the strategy to drive traffic through YouTube's ecosystem. You know, not just the homepage, but they have YouTube Nation. So we work with YouTube Nation to make sure that we're, we're, we have content featured there. And some of their top YouTubers, we're licensing content to them to make sure that it's showing up in you know, clip show. This, this, so that's the other way to work with the idea of what is a home page. Makes a lot of sense. You have anything to add? Tony? Yeah, I mean, the home page is becoming just more relevant to, to yourself. It's all about relevancy. It's kind of like Viddy and those different kind of video viewing portals where your data is getting tracked through YouTube these days. So your basic, the home page is now more what, what YouTube recommends for you versus, you know, kind of like three years ago, ad hoc, whatever is most popular in terms of viewership. Um, yeah. So Mary, one of the most more interesting YouTube developments is what I, I've learned to be what's called the Brand Accelerator Program. And I guess at this point, it's limited to a select amount of brands. There's rumors that it'll be opened out up to new brands, and it'll aid in discovery and, and um, mass, mass consumption of content. Could you give a little bit of insight on that? And, what brands need to do to try and qualify for that brand accelerator program? Sure, so uh, thank you for the plug. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it's the YouTube brand partner program. Um, and we launched uh, last September with a pilot class of seven brands. Um, and these are uh, big, big brands. So you know, our pilot class had uh, PepsiCo, Amex, J&J, &J, and Clean and Clear. Um, and we're very much going for traditional marketers that are a little wary of this whole content thing and not necessarily sure how they should do it. Um, and we start with a really immersive workshop actually here at our YouTube Space LA, which I highly recommend people in the room go and check out. It's a very open door policy. They actually have free happy hour on Friday afternoons. So it's in Playa Vista. It's a 45,000 square foot um, production facility. Howard Hughes is an old aircraft hangar. It's the fun fact. Uh, but anyway, we bring the brands down there. And so a lot of this is just an inspirational look at what's happening around you. You need to understand this ecosystem. It's a wake up call. We'll do a three or four day workshop where we really put pen on paper, we introduce them to creators, uh, try to understand, try to make them understand how to do successful collaborations, but also make their own channel strategy. And then after that, we're giving them uh, what we call partner managers. So traditionally, the, the service that our brands get is limited to media specialists who can sell stuff. Uh, our partner managers tend to work with the biggest partners, right? So Michelle Fawn, when she has something go wrong with her channel or wants to understand why her subscribers are fluctuating, she calls in a partner manager to review and do an audit and, and go deeper. So we're giving those resources to brands. Um, and yeah, we're at about 47 brands now globally in six markets. We will continue to expand over the coming months. Um, hopefully I get funding for 2015 mm -hmm. to continue it. Um, but then we're doing a lot of other things. I actually, if someone asks a good question, I'll give this to you. We wrote a playbook. Um, so this is the YouTube creator playbook for brands. Uh, this lives online. It's just, if you Google it, you'll find um, it's about 110 page PDF that is taking the creator playbook, which has existed, translating that to brands. And we're gonna do other workshop and um, try to do kind of more inspirational events. So in general, yes, we're growing. The accelerator itself will remain limited to, to really our um, biggest customers and the biggest global brands. Um, but you should see some of the resources and frameworks start to trickle down in, in a little bit more widespread manner. Now, there are a lot of big brands in attendance here, the likes of Sony, WB, Mattel, and so on. Can you give us a few insider tips on how to potentially qualify for this program in the future? Sure. So talk to your account team at Google. <laughs> Say you're interested. That's the step one. Um, 
Yeah, we haven't actually worked a lot with media companies because you are traditionally content makers, so that's not one that we're really looking at as a target vertical. We hope that you know how to make content, being a content maker. Uh, but a lot of it is looking for the brands. Uh, Taco Bell is a brand in our program. Someone who's really raised their hand and said, I want to be more like a publisher. I don't want to just be a marketer. Tell me how to do this. Uh, so we don't, we don't want to pull brands into this program. Uh, we really want folks who are raising their hand and saying, I need help. Tell me how to do this better. Tell me how I can work with through my organization. You know, how, which agencies should I bring? And we ask for a very uh, kind of heterogeneous mix of people. So they can send eight people to our workshops, and we want them to bring you know a more senior client that makes sure this gets done, a brand manager to actually execute it, their creative agency, their media agency, their content agency, their PR agency, whoever is touching this stuff. Because I think I'm sure many folks in the room can relate a lot of the hardest part, there's a lot of nodding heads and yeah, this is great, and then the execution is where all of this crumbles. Because you tend to be talking to five or six agencies, there's no way to orchestrate or ma move faster. Uh, so a lot of that is slow and steady from us. So we're looking for brands that are recognizing some of that dysfunction and want to fix it. Right. Now in terms of upfront planning and strategy, what, what kind of tool sets do each of you use to try and plan out a campaign to maximize discovery? So from a media standpoint of view, you know, our whole goal is um, we focus on, you know, I say this word a lot, contextual-based targeting, I kind of say in my dreams. But <laughs> basically, um, it's focused on helping an advertiser take their content, find all the relevant content around that across YouTube. There's tens of millions of places where you can actually run ads on YouTube through YouTube auction. And those, are, those places are kind of, you need to really identify them. So we built a platform that basically allows for a curation of that to find the top five, 10,000 videos, provide that pre-campaign so you can actually see where you're advertising against and understand it's brand safe, it's something that's appropriate, it's contextually relevant, so that at the end of the day, you can get the higher click-through rates by being against content that's relational. So a bunch of people on this panel actually use Tubular, so hopefully they'll say <laughs> Tubular when it gets to them. Um, but we, so Tubular is a tool, so um, we hope you'll all use it. We've got about 2,500 publishers that use it today, um, ranging from people like Seventeen and Vice, Jamie Oliver, to uh, YouTube networks like Machinima Maker um, and uh, Style Hall, to Fortune 500 brands. And um, yeah, and there's a free tool too, so go to tubularlabs.com and check out the free piece. It'll tell you a lot about your audience. Who's, what are they watching when they're not watching your content? What time of day are they engaged? Who are the most influential people that are engaging with you? All that type of information. Um, plus, there's enterprise tools for people who are looking for deeper insights on influencers, on content, on um, where they should be running promotions. So we recently worked with a brand um, who had an ad around uh, their product, but also anti-bullying, so we ran their um, they are content on top of all the anti-bullying content on YouTube. And uh, they had, I think, 6x the, um, the click-through and 3x the view-through. So we see really positive results using data. Yeah, and I think I heard you mention earlier that you have a mission control style of approach to big data. Now, how does that help you not only identify the right influencers to partner with, but how does it help you figure out how to plan out a campaign to best activate and, and populate content? Yeah, thanks for asking. <laughs> um, yeah, so no, we, uh, you know, we believe in this holistic approach. So in terms of influencers, we can tell you um, what your audience overlap is like. So if you're a brand, when people aren't watching your content, what influencers are they already watching? And or are there influencers who are already engaging with you and are creating content about you? Um, and that's obviously an easier conversation to have than just reaching out cold. Um, and so we sort of start from an audience analytics perspective, meaning y who, who um, like, you know, the mom audience on YouTube, what are they watching? The gamer audience on YouTube, what are they watching? Um, what influencers are most popular? What content is trending? And, and move from there all the way to um, recommending what influencers to partner with and then promoting it on con content that your audience is watching. You know, in, in context of your qu you, the question, the, the question about um, you know making it go viral, I guess is, is kind of where you're coming from. Yes. In in on this panel, I think I'm the brand in that our company represents a piece of content, and we try to drive um, as much um, 
recognition of it as possible across as many channels because then it, then it brings more value to it and we can license it out and it's sort of this perpetual cycle for us. And we are able, we bring in about 150 clips a week and we are able to spot um, within that, you know, three or four that we think, we call them hot tickets and we ring bells. We just know it's like, okay, we've got to put everything behind this. This is Tara the hero cat and she just saved a little boy from a dog and everything has to stop in the office. And the, the team in about 40 minutes is, I don't, we are um, well oiled to build an entire marketing strategy to create something viral. And that includes using Tubular uh, and figuring out the influencers that we need to alert immediately. Um, uh, there are blogs. We have a proprietary blog matrix that's massive that we can, um, uh, using YouTube analytics, we were able to tell who showed, who, who published our content in the past, what, what kind of content they publish, uh, and then all the social platforms that we create, we optimize content for, whether it's Vine, uh, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, and we just, you know, like, it's like a mountain, like, moving through. We, c we can do it pretty fast. Um, uh, it's a new kind of marketing strategy. It's very new, and it's, it, again, it's scary to a lot of brands because it happens so fast. Um, but w we, uh, we, we've done okay, and um, yeah, it, it works. Now, the type of discovery you, um, you specialize in is actually a little bit different from my understanding in that you take a licensing, a co-branded, and a product placement style of approach to syndicating content outside of the YouTube ecosystem. So how important do you think that is in maximizing the success of, of content distribution? Diversification is the key to success, right? Yeah, and can you provide a little bit more insight on the type of vehicles that you guys can have access to, but then also how some of the marketers in attendance today can actually take advantage of your platforms and optimize their content for discovery within your your criteria so you could syndicate the news sources and some of the other alternate channels that you talked about. Mm -hmm. um, if there are any brands here who are interested in um, working with UGC uh, to, 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 to be part of a social trending conversation, um, who want to be part of the zeitgeist when it's happening, um, do please come talk to me. Um, I'm really happy to start that conversation. Um, uh, I I don't know what else to say, actually, besi it besides seems that. Like based on some of the discussions we've had, a lot of the content that you currently have focus on human interest, some of the laugh out loud type of clip type of content. Yeah. Now, how do we take that and make it relevant to some of the brand people in, in the audience and create content that maximizes the chance of being distributed yeah. through all the alternate channels that you're talking about? Yeah, great question. Uh, I'll give you an example, which we did not do. Um, you might have seen in May this amazing clip. It got 35 million views in seven days of a guy in Machu Picchu got hit in the head by a boot. Uh, on a, tra a train conductor hit him in the head and he caught it on his phone and it was like, we call it train selfie. We <laughs> immediately thought, and that was the hashtag actually, and it's Jared, he lives up in, in Toronto, amazing guy. Um, we immediately thought, hey, let's get Skechers on the phone and let's try to give them 100% share of voice of everything we do with this campaign. Um, we didn't pursue it, actually, because we, we really felt the time it would take for the brand to buy in, we would lose the virality on it. We'd lose the opportunity. But that's, a, that's an example of where marketers should be thinking of uh, as we move beyond traditional marketing. It, um, it's it's got to evolve. Now, a lot of the discussion today is centered around YouTube and the YouTube ecosystem, but obviously there are a lot of other video delivery channels in existence today. now. In your opinion, what do you feel the most valuable alternate channels are to feed into YouTube, or how to best use those? You know, one, a lot of people kind of think about YouTube as just one funnel. Um, you know, everyone buys a lot of media, right? People buy Facebook, people buy search, TV, radio, and there's not a lot like connectivity between both, right? But what if you can take your most core fundamental advertising channel, which is Google search, no one talks about it anymore, but everyone spends a lot of money through it, and take the performance results of those type of keywords 
and translate that for your video campaign, wouldn't it be more ROI focused? So, th so it's kind of interesting concept. So this is something um, that you some people should explore is taking and connecting search campaigns, Facebook campaigns, Twitter campaigns, TV campaigns with with YouTube, and it's it's something that we're actually doing with Marin Software, uh, who's uh, the oldest guy in this space, and connecting search and video. Yeah, it's an interesting notion, especially since we heard in the keynote earlier today about how Land Rover is actually using traditional broadcast as a discovery tool for driving through to YouTube. So with that said, I mean, what other vehicles do any of you think are viable for this type of approach? You know, there, there are, you, if you're reading the digital press, you, you see there are all these new platforms trying to compete with YouTube as a, an alternative you know, option. You have Daily Motion. You have, you have, the Blip Player, which is now owned by Maker, so it's Maker TV. There, are, there are just so there, there are there. Actually, there aren't that many, but they're they're out there, and they're basically offering the brand a higher cut of the CPM and more control. So you're you're trading. You're, it's a trade-off. It's like okay, so I'm not getting as wide of an audience, but I'm getting higher, potentially higher revenue and a higher conversion control. I own the audience more. Um, yeah, I mean, I would just, uh, I, I try to think of, tell the brands I work with to think of it as a wheel. So if your video is in the middle, that's really your channel spine. I'm a YouTube person. I don't have a comment on the benefits of the Facebook native player. Sure, I'm sorry. Um, but, <laughs> you know, if you think of the, the URL, of, of YouTube video is actually very liquid to Eric's earlier point um, in that it travels anywhere and actually 500 hours of Facebook, or sorry, 500 years of uh, YouTube is watched every day on Facebook, right? So we're a very embeddable format. It doesn't really matter where you consume and you know, same with blogs or it's in a Twitter feed. The idea though is most marketers are still thinking about them as separate entities and they're really, it is an orchestrated wheel. So a visual I like to use is you have your video, uh, ch your, your channels of the hub in the middle of a wheel if that's your video play and then what are your spokes, right? That might be putting a 15 second cut on Instagram, it might be embedding it on Facebook. Um, some of that's your partner angles as well. If you have talent relationships, are you actually having them tweet or post the video um, concurrently with your media push? And all of those, once you kind of make the wheel larger, clients' eyes start exploding because they're like, there's so many touch points. But it really is, if you want to stay with the YouTube player, I would advise you do it. It makes life pretty easy because our player travels wherever you want and all your reporting is aggregated into one analytics platform so you can learn pretty fast. So obviously you can embed it in Instagram video right now, um, but as much as you can, I mean, I'm biased, but I think it makes life a lot simpler. And, and in support of the YouTube player, do not underestimate the user experience off platform. If somebody embeds a player on their blog or their digital publisher using another player and that consumer that you want to watch your content doesn't really recognize that player, isn't that comfortable with it, you're gonna lose them. Yeah, and I, I just echo that, that a lot of brands are really afraid. They turn off embeds because they don't want their video to leave their sacred walled garden. And that's what leads to 60, you know, duplicative videos that clutter though and then they yell they're like why aren't I at the top of the search results I'm like well you didn't let your video become embedded and someone's gonna rip it offline repost it probably monetize it and suddenly you've lost all the reporting um, so that's a pretty easy one that I, I don't totally get the logic of why they wouldn't turn it on um, other than brand safety or things like that but it's gonna get out there anyway so it's better to just acknowledge the chaos first try to control it great so I'm getting the wrap-up warning now so I have one more question for each of you now in your opinion who do you think is doing a, a good job or providing best in class, uh, uh, providing a best in class example of discovery of content? There's uh, there's one campaign actually Brendan just mentioned, uh, Apes with AK-47 or uh, Planet of the Apes. It's actually something we worked on together. Um, I think that's actually it's an older campaign, but that's one paradigm. I think it's still today. Very, very relevant. In addition, you know, to to what Pepsi has done uh, through some of their viral videos with Kyrie Irving. And, 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 and what in particular have they done to stand out of the crowd? Do you think? I think the content creation part of it is spectacular, right? The AK-47 video was absolutely, you know, a, a very intriguing video. Along with the distribution side of it, I think 
um, that really creative impact. And also like something like a Pepsi, who we work with for Kyrie Irving's, um, you know, that's something also where it was a long, long video. Uh, they were able to also kind of do multi-channel uh, distribution. So not only did they uh, distribute that on YouTube, they also started promoting that video on television and other components of it where it just became more of a holistic campaign. Great example. I think that um, discoverability can mean many different things, but two things especially. One, from a platform platform perspective, right? YouTube is so giant, so discoverability is hard. Um, something like Vine, which is smaller and more manageable today, you know, it's, it's like YouTube years ago, is doing a really good job curating content. If you go to their homepage, it will say, World Cup, comedy, you know, this is what's trending now, and it's a sort of a platform discoverability issue. Um, from a, from on a platform like YouTube, in terms of brands do, doing things to become more discoverable, I think tent pole events is a really important concept. So around the World Cup, you saw Nike um, have great content. A lot of brands had content, which obviously they were promoting, but at the same time, it was so in line with what people were searching for. So don't forget to sort of tie into tent pole events and things that people are already searching for and um, try and win that, that sponsorship opportunity. I think it was said earlier that um, you know most people won't click on something unless they've seen it like ten times, share in their Facebook feed or something like that. Um, and everyone who has a social media account is an influencer to some degree, right? We all have friends and family and so on who follow us on these social platforms. And so I think you know you really can't overlook the the power of many many small individuals and in, in crafting brand content around what's shareable. You know, I think if you're going to look at anyone in that regard, you got to look at BuzzFeed. You know, no matter how much it pains me to say it, I love them. But, you know, um, they're making really shareable stuff. And the principles that underlie their shareable stuff is the stuff that I think is the most exciting thing about what they're doing. Yeah, I'm, I'm really honored to go into my office in Culver City every day at Jukin and work with this incredible team. We are in the business of discoverability. We need our videos to be discovered by you and shared every day. And I think we do it pretty well, and I'm really proud to be a part of that. Five million and growing Fail Army YouTube subscribers who are unbelievably active and vocal across YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, it's, it's extraordinary. And um, really, um, I'm just so grateful this is where we are at in, in, in content creation and marketability. I just, um, I love BuzzFeed. If you guys ever have a chance to see Zay Frank, who's their EVP of video and really launched that channel speak, he's incredible. And, and the science behind how they've isolated what people are sharing is, is really phenomenal. I'm going to use a little bit of an older example, but I think a lot of people don't understand the example fully, um, which is the Volvo trucks piece from that went crazy viral in November. And actually a really fun fact is that if from a global search volume, more people were searching for Volvo trucks than great sex in the UK in November, um, which is a pretty phenomenal <laughs> uptake. Um, but again, the, that video went viral. It was an incredible viral video. But what a lot of people don't realize is that they've been doing that for a year and a half. And they had an entire trove of a channel ready to engage with users after they saw that one video, right? Because once you saw it, you're like, what did I just watch? And down to the titling, it was Epic Split number six. So immediately, you're like, well, what was one, two, three, four, and five? So you want to go find them. Um, so I just think from a comprehensive channel strategy and really thinking through, um, there's a framework that you can read more that we call Hero Hub and Hygiene, which is recognizing you're going to have big temples, but you have to be for all the in-between days too. Um, they're the channel that I think last year just blew everyone out of the water and, and really came out of nowhere. And I it pains me to say it spent very little money um, promoting that. They just stuck with a very, very good content strategy. All right, thank you. Um, do we have time for questions? No. Okay. So thanks to Mary, Andrew, Matt, Tony, Allison. Seriously, if there's a critical question, I'm not going to hold that up. This is for you guys. So if there's something critical, if not, we'll move on. Thank you. Okay, thank you.